Hi. I would like to share an idea with you that I think can help us to put in context the technological progress that we have had so far. This idea is that the man-made complexity we have created is quickly outpacing the means that we have for designing it. And this is taking us to some difficult situations. But before taking us further there, I would like to make sure we're all in the same page. And for this, what better thing than a meme? And a meme that express what people think I do when I say I do uh, design research. The first problem comes with designers. There are so many different types of designers, and uh, of course I cannot really research about all of them. In particular, I do research about complex engineering design systems. So for me, it's about engineering design, product development, and uh, a complex projects where many designers, engineers, and other people need to connect to somehow make things happen in these projects. On the other hand, we have project managers and companies. To be honest, what they want is results. How I get there, and with all the algorithms in the world that I can put there, is not their problem. They want to have things on time and on budget. On the other hand, my PhD advisor, she would like to think I play by the book, and I really go thoroughly through all the theory. My mom, honestly, she has no clue. But I hope after this presentation she gets a better idea. What I think I do, no comments there. What I really do, I uh, am a doctoral researcher in engineering system groups in the Technological University of Denmark, where I study these complex engineering design projects. Basically, what I do is to try to understand these complex interactions between large amounts of people that some somehow managed to put together this, this complex engineering design project. It's all about information flows. It's all about interactions. But why designing matters? What we design is all around us, is interconnected, and dramatically define our world and possibilities. It's quite amazing to see the results of what we have done in the last couple of centuries in terms of technology. And there is no doubt about that. But if what we design is powerful, how we design it is magic. And this magic of design happens in networks. Happens in the network inside of your head, connecting knowledge, making the best of our creative and analytical skills. It happens in close relationships, in small groups, where coordinating, negotiating, somehow manage to, to take things in the direction we want in terms of the design. But more impressively, it happens in larger networks where people often don't even know each other, but they participate in the same tightly interconnected design process. And uh, I think it's fair to say that design research takes us from neuroscience to organizational science and industrial networks in just one go. And something that is also fascinating is that, for the most part, design can, can be boiled down just to information. Information that is materialized in documents, in plans, in blueprints, and that somehow managed to create um, something out of people sitting, for the most part, behind their monitors, not interacting with the manufacturing directly, not knowing them, not knowing the users, and somehow putting together these complex systems that afterwards are actually materialized by some other companies, some other organizations. And uh, it's, only, it's mostly about interactions, and these interactions matter a lot. It's interactions in the product, how things are assembled, but also in the process, how we manage to put together the organizations that deliver uh, these amazing designs. But unfortunately, things don't always happens as planned. And we have had enormous disasters because the design process is not properly managed and the technical complexity outpaced the means that we had to actually design. One disaster that we usually don't associate with a design process problem is the Fukushima nuclear plant um, disaster. Here we 
It's easy to believe that it was impossible to avoid because of the magnitude of the tsunami and the earthquake. But actually, even in the 70s, engineers and designers in General Electric that were manufacturing one of the, uh, and several of the nuclear reactors resigned because they believed the design process was inadequate. And afterwards, official reports confirmed that, that this was a man-made disaster. Another relatively recent disaster is the 2005 floods in uh, New Orleans. Here, a system level problem made it that the embankments that were meant to protect the city actually work against the city. And of course, we have the tragedy of the Challenger, where the communication between two organizations actually meant that a criti critical component failed at lunch. But we should not forget that in all these projects, we have some of the smartest people and the best technology. So it's not really about resources. It's about how we put together uh, things in order to make things happen. And it's about the incredible complexity of the systems we're putting together. And this is a bit frightening because we have ahead of us enormous challenges that include, for example, the co-design of the electric car at the same time, time as, as a smart grid, which is the only way really to make this thing environmentally friendly. We need to radically change educational systems and healthcare, and this requir requires, of course, system level design. But I think it's also interesting to see how we got here, because we might learn a couple of things about where we might head afterwards. Design is and has evolved. And one way of look at this is by examining how many times the word design has been mentioned over time since the 17th century in millions of books. That might give us an idea of the relevance of designing in society. And we can see how from the 17th centuries during the Age of Enlightenment, something happened and a lot of people were concerned about design. Then we see a decrease in this trend during the first and the second industrial revolution. And finally, nowadays we see an increase. But what is behind this? Well, I believe that part of this is that during the 17th century, the Age of Enlightenment, with the rise of reason and scientific knowledge, we were able to actually see an inventor that with his own hands, he could put together fascinating things through an act that was highly individual. It was very emergent, design you cannot really foresee how it will turn out, but in this case, it was the same person that could iterate constantly to see how things were going. But this thing had limitations and challenges, this form of design. It is very hard to scale, and it's mostly limited to local impact, and therefore very expensive. Here we can see how James Watt, just at the verge of the Industrial Revolution, uh, managed to overcome some of these problems by collaborating, in this, ca in this case with the English manufacturing Bolton, to get access to some of the best iron workers in the world that actually opened the door to the Industrial Revolution through the steam engine. Afterwards, during the Industrial Revolution, things changed quite a bit. We see that now design is not individual, it's a collective act. And this meant that the emergence of design, the iterative nature of design continued, but in a very different way. In, an, in a way that profoundly transformed the act of design since then. Here design is distributed, it's mainly about information, it's highly complex and it's strategic because any decision we take are very hard to reverse and have enormous impact. And the limitations and challenges here is that with this separation between designers and makers, we see that design got disconnected from the final design object, limiting the creativity of the designer itself at, of seeing how the, the product of his own mind uh, was evolving through manufacturing. It created functional silos and it reduced the whole overview of the process. The interesting thing is where we head afterwards. I believe that part of the rise of this is that we are now confident that we can manufacture uh, at scale. We want much more. We want and we need better and systemic solutions, more sustainable systems, and customized design. And 
it's the, re the recent changes also can be seen through things like the rise of complexity and networks, which alongside systems can uh, make us feel confident that we see that design is quickly evolved into something that we can call network design. And this network design happens in three fundamental levels. Happens in a small organizations where empowered by technologies and changing mindsets, the designers have been empowered once again. And they are also designers and makers if they want to. Um, we also see it in bigger organizations, of course, but now even though the separation between designer and maker might still be the case because we need uh, high degrees of technical specialization, the situation is that these companies do seek much more connection with the overall environment. And the last and big picture is the industry level. We want much more information flows through the different actors because we require system level innovation. But from here, where shall we go? And the issue is how do we radically reinvent the way in which we design so we can move into a preferred situation? And I would like to share with you three cases that explore the three different levels in which design happens that are part of my doctoral research. The first one is a company called Liquitec. All, all of these companies are in Denmark. Uh, that designs a manufacturer what is called a silicon carbide flat sheet membrane. In short, it's a, a filter that might allow us to have much more affordable and scalable water filtration. What is interesting is that this company represents very well these small and agile organizations where just a handful of designers can go back and forward with manufacturers and try different things and, and make uh, complex design projects happen. And it's all about information exchanges between people and design activities. But in this case, one of their challenges is how they define organically and ag in an agile form their roles without creating chaos. So what we tried to do was to put together all this information about their interactions and their information flows into one single model that shows how different activities actually want more information. And we can see how, for example, one of their activities was much more disaligned than a very socially central activity that required loads of information, in reality didn't get it. So we could actually plan ways to rewire the organization to make things happen. Another example of a large, in this case, a large organization where it's purely about the design um, and not manufacturing is BWE. They do biomass power plants, enormous projects, 180 million euros, where they connect with an, a number of uh, producers around the world in order to put together these complex systems. And here we try to examine the pulse of the project, how this evolving structure of the network might be telling us something very interesting about the small details in the integration of these complex systems. So, we can tell the company, sometimes before things happen, the different uh, problems that might arise in their design process. The final example is an industry level example. This is one innovation network, as there are many in different parts of the world, that tries to create um, innovation and new product development in the Danish Clintech cluster. Here we map the whole um, the whole landscape of technologies and knowledge inside of the cluster containing most of the, the clean tech companies in Denmark to understand where there were opportunities for collaboration, where we could anticipate serendipity and, and try to foster it. So for example, in the in-betweenness between different um, product and, and areas, we could find uh, these gems that might end up in the large innovations that we require. Chair learning points about all this include that visualizations are critical. If we really want to understand the design process, we need to start by stepping back and have a bird's eye view um, of the whole process. It's all about interactions and communications. Um, we cannot forget that in a process that is mostly about information, 
all happens through this process of information transformation that is highly social. And uh, the last learning that went across all these cases is that design needs to have reflection and a very important empowerment of designers. Um, and this also shows up in the graph, where you can see that now for the first time, it's not just about designing, it's not just about the verb design, it's about designers. And uh, there are a few new tools in this trade that we need to use in order to empower these designers and embrace complexity. One is design thinking, system thinking, complexity management, and network thinking. Through these tools, we can try to improve design by understanding how we design. Because how we design will end up shaping the systems of the future, um, and they will resemble the structure that creates them. The call for action here starts with the industry. We need to empower companies with new tools that allows them to embrace this complexity and use the properties of their own networks. On the other hand, we need to teach engineers these system-level design skills so they actually can contribute to create these new systems. And governments need to understand that their big data that is behind them, it's meant to be used in the smart ways and network science is there to help them and probably connect with academia might be a good idea. So finally, with your help, hopefully network design might lead us into a future where we create more sustainable system, we learn from our mistakes, and uh, hopefully we won't end up in a world where most of our problems are all man-made. Thank you.